So we're going to look at colonial culture. Yeah. Trying to make this as exciting as I can be. Now, the thing is, y'all, let's look at the early American artists. And this would be useful for you if you guys are writing about, like I said, the, the early Anglicization of American culture and that kind of thing. Um, most American artists, y'all, they weren't kind of the artists like we think of today. Like, I'm going to do my own thing and I'm going to paint this really cool, awesome thing that really shows me and my insides and all that. No, no. The artists back then, y'all, they were like, I need to make a living. And how do I make a living? Not by painting landscapes, not by painting weird stuff. No, I make a, I make a living by painting portrait pictures of rich people who can afford to do it. Kind of like if you're a photographer today, you might, might make money by taking fancy pictures of famous people as well, too. It pays the bills. And if you got time, yeah, go do some cool stuff that is really more reflective of you and your art. Now, the man shown here, this is a self-portrait, Benjamin West. He is probably the most important of early American um, photographers, or painters, I should say. Um, the sad thing is, though, for most of these early painters, and you guys notice on the fillable guide I gave you, I gave you a page that kind of is, is it's from a comic book, excuse me, I mean a graphic novel. Because we adults, right, we don't read comics, we read graphic novels. And I've got kind of a little summary of American art. If you want to know a little bit more about these folks, you can read that. But the thing is, y'all, almost as soon as these artists became popular, they left. If they started making the money or got a name, they left America and they went back to Britain because that is where the money was to be made. We call this a culture drain or a brain drain when you lose some of your best people. And it was definitely a problem for the early American artist uh, to have this. Much like when I lived in, in Canada, y'all, in, in grades eight, nine, and 10, um, we, uh, we noticed, and a lot of Canadians would get mad, y'all, when a band would get popular, an actor or a comedian would get popular. What would they do? They would leave Canada to come to America to make the big money. So whereas once we were the victim of brain drains, culture drains, whatever, Today, a lot of the world's most talented people come here because this is where they get a bigger audience. This is where they'll make them more bucks. Benjamin West was one of those. He left America after getting a big name for himself, but not before he earned the title, the father of American painting or the founding father of American painting. Why does he have that name? He has that name, y'all, because he trained pretty much all the other famous artists. And that is why a lot of their art looks kind of the same. Uh, and notice the art back then, y'all, it is very accurate, very representational. It's not at all kind of modern or anything. If I'm going to pay somebody a lot of money to paint my picture, it better look like me or better yet, it better look even better than me. I don't want some twisted face or three noses or four eyes or something weird like modern art today. I want something that makes me look good or better. It's like if you go to something we used to have called glamour shots. Well, I'll be doggone if I'm going to pay a fortune to have them take a picture of me the way I really look. I want to look better. And that's exactly what Ben West would do for you. Now, another thing that he does, y'all, is paint what we call historical painting. And he was really particular about his historical painting because what he did, y'all, was paint it. It would have really looked. It was very common back then for a lot of people, for whatever reason, if they did quote a historical painting or a painting of something from back in the day, they wouldn't paint the accurate clothes that the people would have worn there. They love to paint people in Roman and Greek dress for whatever reason, even if they weren't in ancient Rome or ancient Greece, they would still paint that on there. But this painting, y'all, The Death of Wolf, commemorates the death of Britain's soldier, or Britain's general at the Battle of Quebec, or Quebec as we would say in Canada, eh? um, the Battle of Quebec. Now, this was the most decisive battle of the French and Indian War. Wolf, who was dying of tuberculosis, is out there in front of his men. He faces the French general, General Montcalm. Oh, 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 oh. And, um, and both generals actually get killed in the battle. How often does that happen, y'all? Most generals are way back behind the lines. They're nowhere close. Wolf gets wounded and he dies and Montcalm gets wounded. He gets to die in bed though. But here he is, he's dying with his men. You can just see him. Don't have much longer. Can't make it much more. 
you know, and you see them looking at him. You see some of those officers. You even see a Native American Iroquois or Mohawk Indian watching him um, because those were some of the few Indians on the side of the British. Over here in green, you got an American Ranger. Uh, the Rangers really weren't at that battle, but as an American, and he's still proud American at this point, he wants to represent or show the Americans who participated in this war, if not necessarily this battle. You see the ships back there. You see light. You see darkness. I mean, it's a beautiful painting, and it is ginormous, y'all. It is as big as this whiteboard and the floor underneath it. So it covers a good, good space. And it is one of the most famous and most powerful paintings that he will ever do. Now, I don't know how much money he made from this. Like I said, his real bread and butter was to paint portraits and make money that way. Okay. Now, another artist is this guy. Okay. His name is Copley. I hope that's how we say it. Fortunately, in AP, you don't have to say stuff aloud. You just have to write it or type it, right? Now, he is also very, very famous because he pretty much did nothing but portraits. And he had the luck, y'all to paint almost every famous person of the pre-revolutionary, revolutionary period, okay? They came to him, and if we didn't have this guy, we wouldn't know how a lot of these people... For example, this was a picture of probably the richest man in America at the time. This is John Hancock. Would you like that or what? His face, yeah. He looks like he smells... You think he looks like he smells something bad, like... Man, Thomas Jefferson, you take a bath yet today or whatever. Um, now, he was the head of the, um, what do you call it, the Continental Congress. <laughs> when you sign something and you put your John Hancock on in it, on it, <laughs> not in on it, what does that mean, y'all, to put your John Hancock onto a document? Right. It means to sign it. Yeah, because he wrote his signature big enough so that the king of England could see it without his glasses, right? So that, even to this day, your John Hancock is your signature. So he was super rich. I mean, he was Rick James Rich, as I so often say. Now, this guy is Paul Revere. But you go, Mr. D, he's not on a horse. Well, that was one night of his life, right? One night of his life, Paul Revere rode a horse saying the Redcoats are coming, the, the, uh, the whatever, the regulars are coming, and maybe even the British are coming, which would have been kind of weird since everybody kind of considered themselves British. But I love this picture, y'all. I have seen this um, in Boston, I believe, is where I saw it, and uh, which makes sense since that's where he's from. And uh, he's, he's there posing. He's thinking, you can see. And he's a working man, and he's got in his hand some silver because he's a silversmith. That is how he made his living, and later a coppersmith. And he became quite rich, y'all, after the American Revolution, after American independence, because he provided like the sort of copper, copper covering that went on a bunch of ships to protect them from all kinds of stuff that's in the sea and that kind of thing. But the painting is amazing when you see his reflection in the table there and just the, the wrinkles that the look in his eye and the fact that he looks a lot like Jack Black is also quite amazing too, right? You ever think of that, right? Yeah, there you go. He also painted Sam Adams. Now, here is Sam Adams. Now, Sam Adams, as you guys will see, played a big role in propagandizing the revolution, basically making Americans stay focused on having a revolution when actually the will to have a revolution had kind of disappeared after the Boston Massacre. People were kind of scared, like, man, those last two protests, they got shot. Well, he kept things going through the Boston Tea Party, which he helped organize, and his committees of correspondence. And, thing, and so he plays a big role, although really kind of after and during the revolution, he's not really remembered that well. Sadly, today, Sam Adams is perhaps best known for the beer, right? The beer, which you guys shouldn't know about, but I'm sure some of you probably do. Although ironically, y'all, the person on the Sam Adams label does not look like this guy. It looks like this guy. And so when I was doing some historical research at the Sam Adams Brewery <clears throat> a few years ago, I asked that. I said, hey, the dude on your bottle looks more like uh, Paul Revere instead of Sam Adams. And they said, well, we never said that that was Sam Adams on the Sam Adams bottle. I'm like, 
I mean, but besides, would you buy a beer that had a dude that looks like that on it? Or this guy? This dude looks cooler, doesn't he? Like, yeah, man. Gonna have me a couple in a little bit and make some more silver. Okay, so there you go. Now we got this guy who really does look ticked off. This is Charles Wilson Pill. And if I were painting a picture of myself, I guess I would paint a picture of myself painting a picture of myself because he's got his little paint palette there. He's like looking in the mirror, you know? This is like an early selfie, except it takes days to do, right? So there's Charles Wilson Pill. Now he is considered the artist of the revolution because he was there for a lot of the big events. Washington Cross in the Delaware, I can paint it because I'm there, right? I was there. And so a lot of the famous events get painted by him. Now, another guy named Trumbull, who I think is on that page I gave you, I didn't put him on the PowerPoint, but Trumbull also is going to be very, very famous for his revolutionary scenes as well, too. In fact, his revolutionary scenes, Trumbull's that is, and he was there for a lot of the battles, are decorate the, um, the rotunda or of the uh, Capitol building, you know, the little dome part. Um, but I, I don't have him on here, but he is on that sheet that I gave you. All right. What's interesting is, like I said, this guy was there for a lot of battles. And he perhaps painted one of my favorite pictures of George Washington. Now, this is a young George. This is like the steadily healthy George back in the day, right? This is George after the French Indian War, but before the American Revolution. This is like George has arrived. And what I like about George is he's got a belly, kind of like I do. Like he's all fit, but he's like, yeah, but I still got the belly too. He's got his hand in the pocket. That was a very cool kind of like, I'm bad, I'm bad. I don't know why, but I've got my hand in my coat kind of picture here too. But he's looking pretty tough, right? This guy's going to become the father of our country. Although ironically, he himself never had any children, but he had a country instead. Okay, pretty impressive. Now, he also painted people like this Jefferson painting, really one of the few really decent paintings we have of what Thomas Jefferson looked like. We can thank Charles Wilson Pill. But what I really find interesting about the guy is he wasn't just a painter. He was also a scientist. Um, he studied biology, studied zoology or zoology or whatever you want to call it, right? And um, he, at his home um, or near to his home in Philly, get down Delphia, he had this amazing exhibit. You can see how big it was, y'all. It was one of the first science museums in the world and definitely the first in America. Now, what he did was he collected bones, he collected fossils, he collected animals from all over the world. And you gotta remember, it isn't like today where, you know, hey, let's see what the animals of India look like. Hey, what do the uh, birds of Ireland look like, you know? You couldn't just go online and check it out. But what he did was he had these things all basically preserved, uh, like I said, fossils. And this is really before we have a big understanding of dinosaurs and things. And I've really examined this painting like ad nauseum and studied it um, a lot, found a really good print of it or a version of it that I could almost like cut up and really examine it. But look at up here, y'all. He's pulling it up, basically giving you a peek a free peek at this neat, um, this neat place he's got. Here you see an animal-like skull down there, right? You see the teeth and stuff in front of him. But what I like back here is, if you zoom in a little bit as I'm doing, you can see like various birds and things. Each of these, y'all, this isn't a painting as a lot of people think. These were actually like little cubby holes holding basically preserved copies of these animals. Never seen a penguin before? I got you one, you know? Never seen, you know, a, uh, what do you call it, a peacock? I got you one, okay? And so people could come there with their kids and wander around and see this. And in fact, while they were working on the Constitution, you know, when they needed a break, if they weren't going to the bar, which they did a lot, Queen's Tavern over there, it's where a lot of our Constitution was written, um, they would hang over here, y'all, and like, hey, let's go see Pills Museum. Yeah, man, and go check it all out. Probably not very exciting for you and me today. We're kind of jaded. We've seen it all. But for these people, y'all, this is about as good as it could get. Pretty, pretty, pretty awesome. So there he is. So fascinating character. More than just a painter, a scientist and collector and, and all of that.
Now we come to this guy. This is Gilbert Stewart. Here's a self-portrait as well, an early selfie, if you would. Now he did, and this is a number, a gazillion, technical number, a gazillion uh, portraits of George Washington. Pretty much you see a portrait of George Washington that was painted like Gilbert Stewart, Gilbert Stewart, Gilbert, and you'll be right like 99% of the time. This is perhaps his most famous one. Now this painting was such a big deal, and it's, it's almost like life-size, y'all. This painting was a big deal because in 1814, uh, I guess, yeah, it was 1814, the British invaded, Mer well, they invaded uh, Washington, uh, D.C. They made their way up the coast. Our guys got their butts kicked, and the British come into our nation's capital. And our president, James Madison at the time, has to flee. Now, his wife, Dolly, she stays behind because she is packing up the White House, y'all. She is taking all the valuable stuff from the White House to make sure that it doesn't burn because indeed everything else does get burned. And it was embarrassing, y'all. The British, they get there. They find the love letters between James and her. The meal that had been cooked was still warm. So they sit there and the Brits enjoy the food that she had meant for her husband and herself to have. But she takes this painting and saves it. And we still have it today. Another painting of Washington that he did. This one is kind of forgettable, but man, what a nose. Wow. Okay, the nod. And then did the unfinished painting. Now, you can look up and try to find out why it was unfinished. Um, but this painting always confused me as a kid. Um, you used to see it hanging in American schools. In fact, the, the little school my mom went to in Oklahoma when she was going to elementary school had a version of this painting up. And my mom was able to ultimately, years later, get that painting and have it at her house. And when my mom passed away, I was able to get that painting and bring it to my house. But what always confused me about this painting, y'all, is why is George in clouds? Why is he in the clouds? Is he dead? You know, it's confusing. But you may have seen this painting. In fact, Mr. D wishes he'd seen this painting a lot more because guess what? It's on the dollar bill. They trim it, they cut it up, and he is on your dollar bill, which, you know, I don't know if we have those anymore. I mean, paper money, y'all, was dying, and then COVID has really, really impacted paper money. It's like, I go to places, and they're like, we don't take cash. I'm like, okay, sorry, man, you know. We take plastic, but we don't take cash. So it is kind of interesting how that's all happening, right? Okay, then we come to this guy, Ben Franklin. Okay, Ben Franklin. Now, colonial literature um, was not really great, y'all. I hate to say it. Most of the time when Americans wrote, if they wrote anything original, it was on politics, usually complaining about the British or usually complaining about their own system when they won their independence. That was something. Or religion, especially in New England, y'all. You had all kinds of religious debates that were published. Now, as far as reading fun things, you know, novels and stuff, Americans were kind of undistinguished. In fact, sadly, Americans often plagiarized or copied a British book. A book gets popular in Britain, cool. Somebody brings it over on a ship, somebody reprints it here, maybe changes a few names, gives it an American setting, and boom, we have a book that Americans can read, but it wasn't really an original work. So there aren't a whole lot of great early American authors really until probably the early to mid 1800s and we get a few then. But this guy, Ben Franklin, is gonna contribute particularly two works. One that has become world famous is called Poor Richard's Almanac. Now, an almanac y'all is something for farmers usually. It, it tells you like when there's gonna be an eclipse when there's going to be, you know, sunrises and sunsets and kind of gives you an idea what the weather's going to be like. It's very useful for farmers and, and people like that. Now, when he printed this, though, y'all, it didn't always work out. There were gaps and stuff. If you've ever in the old days had to, to do your, where you do your layout, like if some of you are in yearbook or something and you're doing your layouts, uh, you find like, oh, man, what am I going to put here? You know, it needs to put something here. And so Ben, y'all, started putting little aphorisms, little sayings 
that have become really very, very famous and have long, long outlived him. I'm going to give you a couple that you probably heard before. A doctor, no, excuse me, a doctor a day keeps the apple away. Yeah, no, not that one. The apple a day, keep, an apple a day keeps the doctor away, right? You've heard that. One that I don't have up on here, but it's if you lay down with dogs, you're going to wake up with fleas. Okay, it has lots of possible meanings there. Um, fish and visitors both stink after three days. If you've ever like left fish in your refrigerator for like three or four days, you'll know exactly what he's meaning here. And visitors too, after three days, they kind of wear their welcome out. Um, three may keep a secret if two of them are dead. Early to bed makes a man, uh, an early to bed and early to rise. In other words, you go to bed early, you get up early in the morning, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise, right? He believed that if you got up early and you worked hard, it could it would make you wealthy, okay? Um, if you would be loved, loved, uh, let's see, if you would be loved, love and be lovable. And so he would come up with these sayings, y'all, and a lot of them become famous and they're just all over the place. Now, here's a book that I read um, in college uh, and really, a lot of American kids used to have to read this. And in your English classes, if they truly did American Lit, they would have you guys read at least some of this. It's a fascinating book because it's his autobiography, perhaps one of the most famous, if not the most famous autobiography ever, meaning, of course, that he wrote it. Now, of course, because he wrote it, you know, he's going to not exactly be honest, right, in some places. I mean, goodness knows there are things about my life I wouldn't want to share. And there are things that I would probably distort uh, about my life if I were writing about it. Nobody really would completely ever tell the truth about them. Um, you know, there's just going to be things you miss. And it's sort of his story of his early life, his problems with his brother, him running away, and then coming to Philadelphia, and basically him becoming this incredible best-known American in the entire world. I mean, this guy is amazing, y'all. Scientist. Um, diplomat, you know, um, he could do it all, printer, writer. And, uh, but one of the most curious things he does in this book is he, he comes up with this idea that he is going to make himself perfect. I mean, I remember that day when I tried that and it didn't work out too well, but he comes up with a list of what he calls 13 virtues, basically things that he needs to work on, like being more humble or showing humility being more temperate, you know, not getting angry and mad and cussing and things, not drinking so much of the cervezas and stuff like that, you know, so much alcohol and things like that. Being a better, well, he felt on this one, you know, like dad or whatever, or husband, you know, loyalty, all those kind of things. And then what he did is he had uh, different times during the day listed. He had Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And at the end of each day, y'all, he would kind of evaluate himself like, Okay, how did how good a job did I do not drinking today? And he would basically give himself grades like needs improvement, you know, exceptional, fail, you know, failure, whatever. And he would work to making himself better about that. Now that's somewhat ironic, y'all. Him searching for moral perfection. In fact, <coughs> I often yeah yeah I cough when when I say him doing that because. He had a reputation, y'all, and you can see, just look at that guy, ladies and guys, as a ladies' man. That's right. The ladies were all over this guy. You know, like, oh, can I, can I rub that bald head of yours? Like, oh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, but the ladies loved him. I mean, it was incredible, y'all. And he loved the ladies, let me tell you. He had children outside of wedlock. I think one of them he even brought back home for the wife to help him raise. Now that takes guts like, where'd this come from? Well, <clears throat> you know, the chick down the road. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, that's kind of how the dude was. But so interesting, interesting person. So there you go. Now, another person uh, that's just absolutely amazing when you think about what she overcame is the uh, African-American poet named Phyllis Wheatley. Here's a uh, drawing or sketch of what we believe she looked like, okay? And it comes from a book, okay, that was written by her of poetry. 
Now, what makes this story so awesome, y'all, is she came over here as a young girl, uh, as a slave, um, and lived up in New England, I believe. And uh, her mistress or ma, I, mean, I won't say my ma mistress is in the sense of her, um, her master's wife or whatever, taught her how to read. Uh, she did a lot on herself and she became self-educated and a great poet. And she turned out to write some of the best poetry in America at the time. In fact, her poetry was some of the few poetry that England took seriously from America. You know, most American poetry in England was kind of used for toilet paper. Uh, but like, oh, wow, it's Phyllis Wheatley. Okay, it's like decent then. And I have some rare historical animated footage about some people visiting her. You're a slave? When I was eight years old, I was kidnapped from West Africa and taken on a slave ship to Boston. The Wheatleys paid for me and the auction took me home. Mrs. Wheatley helped me learn to read. Not just English, but also Latin and Greek. Please, go on. Well, a few years ago, all of the reading gave me an urge to start writing poetry. And soon thereafter, my first book was published. It has gotten a rather good response in England, though very few copies have been sold in the colonies. That's not surprising. And maybe you should have put pictures in it. <laughs> the Wheatleys have helped me greatly. They even sent me to London. But I don't understand. You're still a slave. My situation is very different than most. The Wheatleys and I belong to the Old South Church. It is our hope that through meeting Africans, white people will realize how wrong slavery is. Right, so there you go. You get an idea about this young, amazing woman who persevered through some amazing thing, but left behind some great, great poetry. All right, another writer that you should know as well, Cotton Mather. Now, he didn't really write novels or anything really very fun to read, but man, he wrote about science. He wrote thousands and thousands of religious pamphlets discussing all the issues of the day and was one of the few people, if I'm not mistaken, to, uh, to sort of criticize the whole Salem witch trial kind of thing, ultimately. Um, and we'll talk about the witch trial when I talk about the Enlightenment and the Awakening and the Great Awakening as well, too. Anne Bradstreet was an amazing woman uh, writer. Uh, you used to read her, too. You used to read a story by her about, uh, or poem by her about her house burning, okay? She is the first woman poet uh, to be uh, published in America, okay? And so her poetry lives today as well, too. And then we got this lady. Okay. Mercy. the wonderful um, Roy Orbison there singing Mercy. Mercy Otis Warren. This lady was married to a Revolutionary War hero. She was the conscience of the revolution and constantly wrote about it. She was a propagandist putting out, writing about the American cause to convince more people to join it because it wasn't as popular as a lot of people tend to think. She wrote plays because remember, maybe people that couldn't read could see a play and be turned to favor the American Revolution. And she wrote really the first real history of the revolution soon after it was over. So in a lot of ways, y'all, she's the first woman historian. Although she's a woman historian, maybe we should call her a her historian. <laughs> to his historian, you get it? Okay, there we go. Now let's move to architecture. This is what's called a Georgian home or Georgian style. After the English run out of their own people to be kings and queens, they actually have to go to Germany to import people, uh, and they bring over a family called the Hanovers. There was George I, George II, George III, and finally George IV. And um, a style that was very, very popular was this house named after the Georgian kings, the Georgian style. What you will notice about it, and this is what a lot of American wealthy people's homes would have looked like, is it's very symmetrical. Same size windows, they look just the same, all right on top of each other, lots of balance, right? And here's another Georgian home. Now, back in the day, I used to do a lot of running and stuff through green tea, right, over here. I can't afford to live there, but I can run through the area. And uh, I was surprised how many Georgian houses are in green tea that have this same sort of layout with everything just absolutely the same and perfect. 
Now, one of the things I didn't put a slide up, but has been mentioned by AP in their books and stuff before, is public or official government buildings. Now, because we saw ourselves, Shaw, as the byproduct of the of the Greeks and the Romans, a lot of early and even to this day, a lot of American buildings have those Greek and Roman columns. That is just sort of showing our debt to them, but also saying we're continuing it, right? We have those great columns that represent power and force. And oftentimes, y'all, when a building is long gone, what is still left? Those columns, right? And so a lot of our official, our government architecture, the Capitol, the White House, the, um, the Supreme Court building, which was actually built much, much later, will have that kind of Greek and Roman sort of look. So be aware of that as well, too. And then yet another Georgian house. There's tons of these things. Now, if you ever go to Virginia, there is a, a restored place called Williamsburg. It has all been rebuilt to look kind of sort of like we think it looked back in the day. And you'll see a lot of Georgian architecture there. It's kind of a fun place to visit. It's kind of like history land instead of Disneyland. They got people dressed up like they lived during the times and they pretend to be during that time. Kind of like when you go to the Renaissance Festival, except this is all year, all century whatever okay but that would be an example that you would see there now poor people might live in a clapboard or clabbered house like this which is simply overlapping wooden boards you would see this in new england right they didn't have the bricks and stuff as much but they had a lot of trees and things that they would cut down and they would make their home here okay they're still popular and believe it or not a lot of them are still standing um you can go there and you will actually still see some of these standing there. Now, what can be more American than the log cabin, right? The log cabin, very American, except it came over from Sweden. The first Swedes who came over here, y'all, a lot of them were pretty poor. They settled in Delaware. They were Lutherans. And uh, they began um, cutting down trees as they did in Sweden and building homes like this with using various, you know, materials to kind of hold it together, right? And also nails. Uh, nails were super expensive. And eventually, you know, Swedes will no longer really be building these. But, you know, who really adopts this are the, are the uh, Scotch-Irish. The people who came first uh, from Scotland to Ireland, Northern Ireland, didn't work out too well for them. And they come to America. Now, the Scotch-Irish tended to be poor, tended to be getting in a lot of fights, and they hated the British. And they moved and they lived out on the frontier. This kind of home was perfect for them. And of course, to this day, when you talk about somebody, an, an early American politician being born in a log cabin, it's really a positive thing. Like he was born in a log cabin, meaning he came from poverty and he self-taught and he wasn't one of these rich kind of guys. We had a president run on you know, this whole idea that he was born in a log cabin. Abraham Lincoln was born in a log cabin. James Garfield. Andrew Jackson probably was. I'm not sure about that one, but I know the others were. In fact, in an essay I had a student do, and I should have saved these kind of things. I just remember them. But a student said Abraham Lincoln had been born in a log cabin that he had built himself. And I'm like, man, that is impressive. While he's in his mama's womb, he is building a log cabin. Must have made for a painful delivery, but man, you got to give the dude credit for trying. I mean, like, whoa, you're the you know, mother of a lovely baby and cabin. Okay, there you go. And then when they would, when they would leave y'all, they would burn their cabin down to get the nails. That's how valuable the nails were. They were worth a lot more than the wood. You could always find more wood and trees. You couldn't find those doggone nails though. So this became like, you know, the idea what the frontiersmen and stuff might, might do. And like I said, we borrowed the idea from Sweden. Now, sadly, y'all, as a music lover, I have to say American musicians were not the absolute best. Most of our music came from European uh, people that we either copied or ripped off or whatever. Um, but you got to remember, you know, it isn't like today when you and I like want to hear a song. What do we do? We pull it up on our phone or whatever. Right. In a matter of seconds, you and I can pretty much get any song. If they want to hear music, then how'd they hear it? they had to play it or they had to go somewhere where it was being performed. And it kind of made it a little bit more special, I gotta say, but it also meant a lot more Americans could read music, 
perform music, sing music, or whatever. Now, this guy had everything against him, okay? Going up, he was missing an eye. He was missing a leg. Um, he was addicted to, like, one of the kind of early kind of drugs of the time, this tobacco, the snuff that you would sniff. He was always, you know, you know, kind of like that, constantly going on. But at least he had messy clothes. He worked as a tanner meaning he, um, he cleaned animals and skinned them and did all that, which made him just smell God awful. But he started writing music and he turned out to be actually good. His name was William Billings. Now, self-taught, he is the only American composer of the time who really uh, had his work published and preserved. And uh, what's interesting is he wrote a song that has become really popular, or did become really popular at the time, so popular, how popular was it, that we actually considered having it as our first national anthem. And the song is called Chester. And I'll go ahead and end with Chester. This could be our national anthem instead of the Star Spangled Banner. Here's the little piccolos or fives, right? With a lot of snare drum. Now, eventually, they're going to come in and start singing. It's about basically defeating tyrants and all that. Okay, come on, start singing. All right, so there we go, folks. American culture. You've been culturized. You know your culture now.